My name is Richard Freudenberger. I uh, am the um, energy and resource coordinator here at Living Web. We've invited Ned to, to come this weekend here to, to uh, teach along with myself. And we have built and are continuing to develop a composting toilet system out here. It's on a trailer out here. That was part of the arrangement that we would possibly at one point be able to bring it to uh, events and, and places beyond this farm so we can, uh, uh, you know, we could sort of share the opportunity to let people see how it works and how the design operates and all that. That particular system is only one interpretation. We'll, we'll talk about several different kinds of, of uh, toilet systems. Um, there's a variety of ways to, you know, get the job done, but we, that's just one particular one. It is, I want to make it clear from the very beginning, it's probably bigger and, and more involved than what most people in this room are going to need. Um, it's also been designed to operate without uh, certain components in it. It will still, it will still function, um, and the cost can be, you know, reduced substantially by leaving those components out, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm going to um, let Ned come up here and just give a little presentation about himself and, and maybe a, a little background while I sort through these papers so we can get these things handed out. Good afternoon, everyone! Good afternoon. All right, wonderful. We got loads of material, which uh, Richard barely touched into, uh, and we are going to be looking at the, the whole discussion of composting humanure from a lot of standpoints. Uh, one thing that Richard and I have been together on for over the years for the more historically inclined, both of us were original members of the Mother Earth News way back when, and uh, so from my standpoint, it's been a real pleasure to get back to hammers and nails and drills and wiring, etc. with Richard on the composting trailer project out there. Uh, I have been giving workshops on this topic now for about 25 years or so. It kind of gets hazy, you know, if you go down to Midwest Renewable Energy Fair and all different local places. Uh, and I also compost myself, and uh, it's something that, it, it's one of those niche topics that is extraordinarily important from so many standpoints, but I'm going to start, I'm going to give you a little outline of where we're going today, but the very first thing to start out is that there's a word that was coined apparently by Joe Jenkins, the author of the Humanor Handbook. And we'll refer to that, it's a fantastic source, fecophobia. It's the fear of dealing with your feces. To even talk about it, to even consider it. And there are severe cases of fecophobia in the United States. Now there's a good reason to have legitimate sanitation fecophobia, so it's not all laughing and games and hilarity, although I I think there's a lot of it that we're going to get through if I'm lucky at all. Uh, now, in terms of this afternoon here, uh, I'm going to start out with uh, a couple of things on why this is important, some of the background on it, and uh, the essential chemistry composting requirements for dealing with pathogens and, and avoiding fecophobic issues and things of that nature. Uh, and we will also look at a, a kind of a a sidebar part of it for uh, uh, emergency composting systems, kind of thing where as opposed to building everything in the house or an outside unit, whatever, whatever when power goes down. You, you know, all these kind of, so they will hit on a little bit. Whether you want to actually build a cabin, uh, you know, build a trailer composting unit out in the yard, you want to adapt one into your home, you have an area you want to build it, you just want to do bucket gardening, there's different elements all that are involved with this. So, you know, so you may say, well, I don't know, but it's going to, I think it's going to be fascinating because we've tried to incorporate all different aspects of the chemistry, temperatures, oxygen, da da da, that we'll go through into that. Uh, we will go out to the trailer at somewhere between 3.30 to 4-ish or so, depending on how we go through here, and then uh, we'll, oh, hands, on, walk through, through the trailer, point it out, check it out, see what we're doing. After we go down and look at the actual unit, we, and you can place the component to the talk and the, and the details of the talk, we'll have a lot more questions. And uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about legalities, a little bit about practicality, and some of that stuff too. So. 
All right, well, let me start off then with, with a why and, and a touch of the history here, uh, because whether uh, you're here in the room with us or you're following us on the video, uh, I really hope that you are able to go away today with a, a very uh, comprehensive overview of what this issue is all about. It's not just the specifics chemistry of how the composting works to kill the pathogens. There's much more to it. And no matter which direction you go in terms of the home or the cabin or the whatever, you know, however you go with it, I personally hope you each will go away with a much greater understanding of what this topic and subject is, what these interrelationships are in terms of sustainability, and why it's important to have these conversations beyond just what you're doing in one little project here. There are a few aspects that are the right way, and there's a huge universe of, we can do it this way, we can do it that way, we can do it this way, we can do it that way, and you get a lot of options, and so there's no exact only one way to do it, and that's really important, so if you want just one answer, you're not going to get it, but once you understand the principles and start moving along, then, oh yeah, that's what we got to do, how can we achieve it, whichever uh, path we go. Now, uh, I think one or two of you mentioned already, why compost humanoid? Well, the first one that pops up for almost everybody is water. And water has been a driving force for composting uh, for many, many decades in, in New Mexico and the desert areas where water is at a premium. Uh, and this is worldwide, but I'm sticking with most of the United States. If you don't have much water, one of the most wasteful things you can do is to flush away two gallons when you take a pee. It's like, wait a minute. You know? And there, it, it just, it does not make sense. And it's not just a philosophical, well, we want to save the water, you know, here and there. The fact is, we are running out of fresh water on this planet. We have an overpopulation problem, and we could go on in this for a while. But the fact is, we are really, really stressing the water resources on the planet and one big factor in that are flush toilets, the conventional systems that it is. Now there's agriculture, there's the pollution, there's a whole range of other things. I'm not blaming it just on the toilets, of course. But when you look at situations, for example, right now in California, the percentage of water that's going into sewer systems from flushing is like, it's amazing. They're in severe drought right now. Uh, the, the southwest is the whole region basically is in drought and so they're looking at all these conservation measures well it gets to a point where you know there's kind of when there's no water what do you do and I know that sounds apocalyptic and all that but what do you do when you really don't have abundant water here in western North Carolina for the most part we're lucky we got plenty of water comparatively to everybody you know, I mean we're in a drought now and all that but it's a big issue uh, so the water conservation is a big one. Um, how many, does anybody have rainwater catchment systems for their home and their bed? All right, all right, four or five hands went up. I do too, all right. I don't want to have to collect rainwater process and do all that if you're just gonna flush it down the toilet. It doesn't make sense. It simply doesn't make sense to use it for, for that kind of a volume of water. So the water conservation by the gallon issue is a big one for a lot of people and especially if you're off grid if you're looking at wells you pump and all these different factors in here uh, come together now on a larger scale than just how much water you've got at your house and i think two or three you mentioned it here already the amount of pathogens chemicals uh lost nutrients that are going into our waterways right now globally is insane has everyone heard of the dead zones in the oceans? All right. Now, the biggest contributor to those is actually agricultural runoff. But there's the same loss of these nutrients that every, every time you squat, as nasty as that was, there's nutrients that bugs and critters and stuff in the soil could be using. Human fecal bacteria has been tracked and connected with the decline of the corals in the oceans. So not just the fact that chemicals and everything is going in it. Human fecal bacteria is part of what's stressing coral reefs around the world. There's, again, there's other factors in there as part of it. Uh, just recently, 10,000 or so endangered frogs, if there's 10,000, I don't know how they get the but washed up dead 
it was it the highest lake? I think it's the highest lake in the world, something like that. And they're, uh, I can't remember the Latin name for them, but they call them scrotum frogs because they're really wrinkly. I was like, whoa. Uh, I had pictures of them. And they died and they connected it directly to untreated sewage going into the lake because of the growing population around it. So there's literally hundreds of these examples where just flushing the feces away is, is creating big problems for everyone. And when we look at, uh, and I'll kind of tie into a little bit, when we look at the uh, uh, Haiti, they just had the hurricane business down there, and that came, which was, you know, a thousand people got killed in there. And also, in, this is going to connect in Yemen right now. Uh, cholera in, in both places now are taken off because of a lack of sanitation. That's one of the vectors, pathogens that gets through feces. <clears throat> I don't know what the numbers recently in Haiti are, but a thousand got killed evidently in the hurricane, and at the rate it's fallen apart, there could be five or ten thousand dying from cholera in Haiti, and it's already up to fifteen hundred people in Yemen from the lack of it. So this is a very, very real thing. It's not just a philosophically nice thing to do. We're facing more and more issues here, and we see it here in the United States on a much, much, much more narrow basis when the power goes out. You know, all of a sudden, boom, power goes, oh, that's okay, light some candles. Here, we'll have dinner, have, here, have a couple more burritos. And all of a sudden, it's like, uh-oh, power's out. Water pump's not working. What are we going to do? You know, so... It, uh, oh, thank you, thank you. So we've got all the, the, the those, these are the big ones in terms of that, and, and the the pathogen issue and sanitation will probably be the singular focus I'll have during the course of this talk to really knock it into you. But another one on that we got that is of interest to living web farms and many people in the agricultural communities. How do we return the nutrients back to the soil? We have currently, when we look at commercial agriculture, um, a one-way shoot. We're mining, we're creating for uh, fertilizers, fossil fuels, creating. The, all these fertilizers are essentially artificial. You know, we can argue on that. It goes through the farming process, then you eat food, and then you take the dump, and then it goes to sewer, just sort of boof. And it's gone. Whoa, we gotta get some more phosphorus. We gotta get some more phosphorus. We get, you know, whereas when you actually look at this whole cycle, by going from, from the ground to the food to the people back to the ground in a simplified way, you're returning these nutrients back to the ground. And this has been done for thousands of years in other cultures. Uh, the Chinese, the Asian in general, uh, apparently have been doing it the longest. The history of composting human war uh, is hazy. I mean, it's not one of the, well, I'm going to write a book on that one. That's a good shit book, you know. So, so we don't have any. But we know that uh, the, the Cretes, the uh, Middle ones, the Greeks, Egyptians, um, and virtually everything in the West, the Asian, all these cultures had, the Romans had uh, the equivalent of flush toilets as well. All these different uh, societies and cultures dealt with their human waste somehow. So looking at all of this, and, and again, th this whole trajectory of history has really been impressive because it's coming. Well, a lot of people say Sir Thomas Crapper was the one who invented the flush toilet, and I thought that for a while. Well, the fact is, he had some improvements, but the very the, the essential flush toilet was actually around in the 1600s, and he was the late 1800s. So it, it, he made improvements, but he put his name on it, and so that's where we got the Crapper from for the name. Uh, and, and that's illustrative in that in London and in, in, uh, basically in England, uh, as the flush toilets really took off and, and, and got installed and started to get sewer systems and all that, the Thames River turned into a floating cesspool. It was just turns and paint, all this stuff, and like, whoa. And it was like, oh, maybe we ought to treat this a little bit first. And what is developed from that, and I'm cutting out lots of details, but what's developed to that are the so-called modern sewage treatment, well, they are modern sewage treatment plants and or septic tanks. And in septic systems, they're considered by the EPA one of the number one sources of groundwater contamination in the country. So yeah, out of sight, out of mind, but this is not a great idea uh, comparatively to, to composting. The sewage 
uh, treatment plants that we have right now for urban and uh, uh, interconnections uh, are really are also a marvel of modern technology in a lot of ways. But you still end up with massive amounts of solids that get uh, packed up and trucked and generally being brought to the landfill to be dumped. So you've got a lot of this stuff. The, the nutrients, again, is that, well, we, we can't use this, so they send it to the landfill. And with the pharmaceuticals, especially in America, with the pharmaceuticals and chemicals and all the other debris that we put down the drain or run through our body, not very, very few of those actually are taken out by a commercial system, commercial municipal system. So that's what's going into the waterways. That's what's mutating the frogs and amphibians. That's what's having impacts on fish. And, and down the list, again, there's loads of examples here. So there's all this kind of, and meanwhile, so all this goes through and the water is slowly treated, it's not really, it's dumped back into the river and, well, it's 10 miles downstream, so, you know, they're like, well, that's the intake for the next, no, it's not. Dilution is a solution if there's plenty to dilute it in. So there's, there's a balance with all this here. So it's really important to remember that, that this idea of composting is, is Humaner is not a new idea at all. In fact, as far as we can tell, the, the first officially certified stamped, okay, you can get away with it, uh, composting toilet was at the original Mother Earth News magazine that uh, Jay Herndon and I think Richard, you were on it, in on it, a number of us put together and worked out there that was designed for a family of four and had a, a rotating barrel and it was a great, you know, it was all, well, the health inspector came out first, the, the, the building inspector, I believe, was first, came out and said, what you building? And we're like, building something great. Well, we're building a composting center. Oh, no, you know, and so the health guy comes out, oh, it's gonna, well, because it was experimental and we were very polite as we could be, uh, I said, well, all right, well, we'll see how it works and we'll come back in the fall. Which, whoa, great. I mean, that was as fair as you could get with anything. So we put it all together, had a big rotating drum. It was a real neat operation, and it was part of every day. Every day, one of the staff team would go down there, clean it out, and rotate the barrel, and do all this work, keep care. Well, there were about 20,000 people that came through that summer. And they would line up for the opportunity to take a pee in Mother's composter. They would hold it until they get in line. Oh, and Mother... So, and it was just like people all over. Well, the fall came, and it came back, and it worked. Everything was fine, and he, said, he goes, okay. And it was signed off on. So, uh, that was just, well, we had no idea. Yeah, it worked. So, we do it. All right. Um, comments, questions, argument on history and why? So did they, to, to really know that it's working, don't you have to do some uh, microbiology? And did they do that? For the certification of the mother of that no, they didn't for that. No, we got away. They, that was not brought up as an issue. But yes, to know that it's fully working, and that I think it, it, I, I, I could be corrected on this, but this is part of our project with the trailer with uh, Patrick Battle here and the farming operation is to rigorously follow the compost itself to analyze it as well as a urine separator, and we'll get into some of that later on to prove it. But. I'm going to touch into that next where you can virtually guarantee it will be fine by sight, uh, sight, smell, and time. And, but yeah, I'm not. Yes, sir. Uh, North Carolina has no design acceptable plan, period. Uh, and there's not a Board of Health uh, Department in this part of the state that I've been able to talk to who will even discuss the design with you. You're mostly correct. If you only have a composter, they go, no way. If you have a flush toilet and a composter, it's legal. We've got paperwork, which makes, there's more sense to that than it seems initially. Right. But, mm -hmm. it, it, yes, ma'am. I just have a question. I'm going to be going up to North Dakota to support the people at Standing Rock, and if there's any way that you can share anything about developing a system in a place like that, which ultimately could serve a lot of people and winter's coming. If there's a way that you can share anything. Bring, bring a, a, a tractor trailer load of hay, mm -hmm. or straw. I that I will really answer that. that. Yeah, no, no, I trust you. I, that, that I, want to talk, I hope to be going to Standing Rock in a few weeks with a wind system, so uh, maybe we'll pass on the road, but, uh, but I will touch on that for the emergency and backup and, and alternatives here. All right. All right. So, so that's the general overview. I mean, there's just as I rattled through that, 
doing your history, doing some research, you can go 24 hours just constantly reading history, background, water, sewage, you know, all this stuff. But that's the way it is. That's, that's where we're at at this point. Now, again, the most important aspect of composting human work is health and sanitation, making sure it's done right, that follow-up and so on. That is the biggie. Because the truth of the matter is, unless you're dealing with massive amounts of composted human ore, you get diddly for the garden usage. And I've had people come to work and say, whoa, we're going to do our organic garden, we're going to do this, and we want to compost all the human, we've got four or five people, and we're going to, well, guess what? You're going to get a, a, like a couple of wheelbarrows a year out of everybody. If you need compost just strictly for agricultural purposes, that's your point, your garden, living web here, and, and you know, all these other guys. <clears throat> the, the approach for lots of good quality compost for agricultural purposes is faster, easier, and essentially risk-free to go for that. You, you are not making, you're not creating human or composting because you want to get the compost. You want to put it back in the garden, you want to save the water, you want to have these backups, you can't, all these other reasons. The compost is literally just a bonus. It's all it is. And, it, it's, it, and, and it's hard to get across. You go, how much are we going to get? I've been composting for about 20 years now, where I am. And 14 years ago now, I strapped together a four by four pallet arrangement for nothing but human or composting, it's not for the garden, and put in straw and started using it right now. Well, at this stage of the game, the, all the pallets have collapsed into it, they're almost rotted out, it's, it's a mound about half the size, and as best as I can tell, it's got about 30 bales of straw and hay in it, and all the material and everything, it just goes away, it just breaks down. So you're not going to get volume out of it. You can do it in a complementary fashion with human work, and then you, and we'll talk about the, the applications for it. Uh, just not do <coughs> crops, put it on ornamentals, trees, and so forth. Use it, put it back there. I mean, it's really good compost. Just you don't, the, the health, the sanitation, disease ve vectors, disease vectors, tough word. Um, so the, that is the big. Now, how do we do that? Well, the composting process, and I can get to use my little thing here, uh, for uh, composting humanure is very, very much like composting in the garden already. And I mean, just from the introductions, I would say two-thirds of you, three-quarters of you already compost, know exactly how to do this, and there's nothing to why can't I do the same thing? Well, because you don't give it enough time, and there's these other factors that would assure that these pathogens are broken down. So in, uh, there's going to be a T, there's actually two, T-O-M-B is the way I put it. Because what's that spell? Tomb. You want to kill the pathogens. You want, the, you want these viruses and bacteria dead, and it works out. Now, the additional T is going to be time. I'll come back to that at the end. But the first thing is temperature. The temperature of the pile determines the rate at which it's decomposing and composting. And there are three ranges of bacteria here. And again, there's whole classes and research projects on it, but syrophilic bacteria, which are cold blooded. And these go from below freezing up, until, up to about 60, 65 degrees, somewhere in that range, where they're active. Very, very slow activity. Uh, not much happens with it, uh, but, the, it that's, but they will compost, given low, you know. Uh, the mesophilic bacteria are the, the bulk of the bacteria that we have in our body that runs from about the 60 range up to about 105 or so. There's a little flux either way. Um, and the mesophilic bacteria are typically the ones that are most uh, utilized in commercial systems because they don't, quite, don't always get up to the highest temperatures. They just take longer to do it. Uh, and the, the best ones, though, the ones you want are thermophilic bacteria. 
These are the bacteria that start at 105 and stuff and can go up to, uh, well, uh, over 200 degrees. It's the type of bacteria you find around thermal vents in the ocean uh, and so on. And it, it, a good range to be happy with in your pile if you're uh, measuring is about 160 degrees inside the pile. And with everything absolutely right or wrong, depending on your perspective of it, it's thermophilic bacteria that can give spontaneous combustion to hay piles. It gets, it can get that hot. It can build stuff up. Now it's got to be ideal situation and tinder and all that. Uh, once you get into the thermophilic range, that will destroy essentially all the bacteria and virus that we're worried about in terms of human pathogens. Now to get to that thermophilic level, that high level in there, we need to have all these other uh, aspects here, kind of the ducks in a row to get there. So keep that in mind, there's, there's a range. At the high end of it, we have really fast acting uh, bacteria that are working on the others, killing, knocking everything down, the composting's going on, and as it gets cooler and cooler, it slows down more. I'm gonna come back to that for winter and other issues. But that's the range, and the hotter you can get it, the higher the temperature, the better it's going to be in terms of how fast those pathogens are knocked down. Now, I'll come back to that, but the next thing is oxygen. There are, and I'm very simplifying it again, but there's basically two types of bacteria in composting and, and breaking down organics. One is aerobic with oxygen, and the other is anaerobic without oxygen. Anaerobic bacteria is what, uh, they, they run the uh, hog farms to create the methane, natural, you know, all that. Uh, anaerobic bacteria is what we're, you can use for a range of other things, but in this case, there's too much to it. Composting is what we, we want, the anaerobic oxygen-loving bacteria. And the surest way to know that your compost pile has gone anaerobic, it stinks. If you do it right, you can get close to right, a compost pile with human work will not stink beyond it. You'll notice it, oh, there, there, there's always burrito night, you know, but it's not, when you, you open it, they go, oh God. You know, people call me up, what, it's terrible, stink, it went anaerobic, what's that? Well, you don't have enough oxygen. And that's, that's one of the things we've addressed with the trailer design out here, we'll get into that with some of the details. Uh, but oxygen, you've got to have oxygen throughout it. That's a big factor in the uh, commercial units when they're using the agitators and stirrers and stuff to, to avoid that. Uh, if you just put, the, you, you, you know, you do like the bucket system where you just dump in a bucket and throw a little bit of uh, uh, wood shavings, whatever, we get a whole list of stuff you can do there. And you put a close up, it's going to go rank. It doesn't take long because it doesn't have, you can't get oxygen around. So it goes anaerobic. Now it's still breaking down, but boy, oh boy, is it nasty and it's, it's, it's the hydrogen sulfide, whatever is the gas. Uh, so oxygen is crucially important to it. Uh, the next one uh, is moisture. Moisture, there's, it's a balance with that. The moisture in the compost is a really important factor. Too much moisture and it will go anaerobic. It gets soupy and sloppy and wet. And this is where, uh, in, especially in, well, our design, most commercial units these days have urine diverters. They want to have two separate tanks, two different ways, so you're not just all peeing into one place on top of it, because it can get, uh, especially when it's in on site and it's not a bucket system. Which, well, I should, I'm going to clarify that next. I'm going to do too far. But the moisture in and of it, what's interesting with the moisture is if you have too much of it, you go anaerobic, everything stops, it gets nasty, it stinks, and oh no. If you don't have enough, it just stops. So if it dries out, you are still, there's still latent bacteria and pathogens in there, but it just stops. If it's dry, it just dry shit, oh well. You're not doing any damage. You're not getting any headway, but it's not a big problem. So when in doubt, you kind of lean toward the dry side because in a general sense, there's two different types of composting arrangements. The bucket system where you collect it, which a number of you have mentioned already, and then you carry it out and you go out to your uh, outdoor 
final, long-term, dump it in there and go. The other type, which is almost always, is, is, well, there's variations, are the commercial systems where literally, hopefully, completely compost in place in the house and what you take out from the bottom of that unit, almost always the bottom of gravity, is finished compost. Note the quotates, <laughs> not quite. But, um, so there's these two differences here. So when you're outside, which I really recommend for a lot of reasons, but it, for outside piles, unless you have massively heavy rains on a regular basis, just leave it be. It'll get wet enough. You don't have to go out and water or do anything like that. Now, if you're in Arizona and you haven't seen rain in six months, you know, dump the air on there. You might hose it down every once in a while, give a little water to keep things going. Uh, I had a cover over my uh, compost pile. I could put it on an old roof, a piece of metal, put it on, take it off, and rain. And it just kind of blew off in the rain. Windstorm, I oh. It's been totally fine ever since. So, uh, and, and that aspect with the moisture is important for drainage too, whether it's, it, it, again, in the commercial systems, the urine diverters, or if you're going out and building a pile in your, on the farm, on the property, in the backyard, where does that leachate drain to? Uh, if you literally build it in a depression and all of a sudden it rains and all of a sudden the water comes up, you're going to go anaerobic. You'll know it won't be hard to find it. Well, in the dark, oh, well, here it comes. It'll, it'll go back. So you, you need to have decent drainage for it. Uh, while I'm thinking about there, uh, it, it's not absolutely proven totally clear, but an outdoor human or composting pile that is doing its thing in the yard is going to leach some of those bacteria and so forth into the ground. However, unless it's flooding all over the place, it appears that, that it doesn't go much farther than about two to four feet around the pile before the bacteria in the ground is consumes it, consumes it and, and it just biodegrades into it. it it's similar to uh, with the septic tank, with your leach field. Yes, it gets in there, yes, there's an area, but once it gets into the soil biology, the worst of it is taken care of. So it, it's not, there's been a handful of studies, we don't know how far it goes, but leave a perimeter is where I'm coming from, and that assumes decent drainage and you know, just on rock or clay, if you see a brown little river coming off of your compost pile, pay attention, because that's the leachate. You don't want that just, you know, going everywhere. Um, and then finally, you want to have a balance of nitrogen and carbon. And the nitrogen that we're going to be getting into the from the uh, for the composting comes from your turds. You're dumping out that that and the urine. It's, high, it's relatively speaking high nitrogen. That's a nutrient that should be in the soil and the gardening, and we want to use and preserve. You got with raw sewage with with your if you, if you don't put anything in, no kitty litter, no sawdust or anything. When you carry that out to the compost, well. Kind of, sort of, that's all nitrogen. It's not really. Well, you know, it's nitrogen packed. There's no real, there's, there's some, there's not much carbon in there. So, what you have in all, virtually every situation here, starting off, is you're going to have too much carbon, too much nitrogen, and not enough carbon. The ratio that has been determined scientifically is 29 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. I didn't figure it out, but they were adamant, 29 to 1. I rounded to 30 to 1 and let it go from there. And what this amounts to is that you kind of can't have too much carbon in the compost <coughs> pile for this process. Because what happens is if you have more carbon than, say, 40 to 1, well, some of that carbon doesn't get used. It doesn't get utilized in the composting process. And it's excess carbon. It's still going to go into the ground, it's the fertilizer on the run. If you don't have enough carbon, let's say you got 15 to 1, well then you're going to have extra nitrogen left over that is not being processed through this, this whole deal. So you're looking for that 30 to 1 range. Now, again, short of a government project, you, nobody's going to measure, well, let's say you know, how many nitrogen, how many carbon, and yeah. again. When in doubt, throw it, in, just add more in there. Uh, is that by weight or volume? Um, 
I believe it's by weight. Isn't, it, isn't that the... Because the vo I, know, I know the volume is weight. Go with weight. I'm, yeah, because well, yeah, vol volume is... Some of the stuff very fluffy and lofty, and then and then the uh, uh, nitrogen material is usually more dense. Yeah, it, uh, the experiences with getting to thirty to one are interesting over the years. There's a lot of materials in there, but the, in an outdoor pile, in an outdoor human or composting pile, my personal experience is the best material to use is straw, bales of straw. No, it's not going to work for everybody about that because they have lots of airspace in it. It's cheap. It's easy to use. It sucks up the nitrogen and the whole process goes on. It's wonderful. It's absolutely fantastic. And you, it, well, we're getting into making some of it. You start off a layer on the bottom. You go out there and you dump your bucket or dump whatever, wherever you are onto the top. And a, about so much straw over the top, not a lot, but enough all over the top. That barrier unless it's 98 degrees in August with no wind, by the time you back away from the compost pile, you can't smell anything. Covers it up. It's wonderful for odors as well. So you can stack up bales of straw, and that's a huge way to deal with emergency situations and composting. And so I actually had discussions with some FEMA reps on this. Is the biggest problem is afterward. You know, so that's it. Um, we'll, we'll come back to those carbon materials. But this balance of nitrogen and carbon, you've got the bucket system where you carry it out to another, at whatever stage it's already composted, pour it on the pile and go. It's a cakewalk to get enough carbon on that if you just know you got to do it. You just do it. You just put it on there. It's trickier with the commercial systems because there's a volume issue in running these systems and they'll tell you know one scoop per poop type thing was one of the adages you know take it up and put it in the scoop like that well you're not getting 30 to 1 out of that and uh, adding enough to in there to really get a full 30 to really get good composting out of it uh, well you can it means more maintenance you got more bulk you got to deal with to come out so people go well no we don't need quite that much you know, and it, but if it's that, if you're doing it, if you're cutting back on the carbon, whether it's the, the kitty litter, the sawdust, the chips, the whatever you're using in an in a indoor, you know, it's just going to stay in place, you're going to have a problem because you don't have enough carbon in there. And that, it's just the fact of the matter. There's nothing to do about it. So uh, and it needs more maintenance. And it, when in doubt, add more, compo uh, more carbon into it here especially if space is not an issue, go for it. It will not hurt anything. Now, the, fit, the back to the T, the top. In agricultural composting, if you do it right, if you're nodding your head, I bet you can do it right. If you set it up, get it ready to go, you can have good garden compost in about 30 days. It'll break down. You know, you've got to sort out what goes in there. There's a little, there's a little science there. It doesn't take too long to get really good garden compost to move it through. And I don't know exact numbers, you know, like 30 to 90 days is like, yo, we're moving, you know, next flow, next flow, comes through, we go there. No problem. With human or composting to get all the pathogens dead, you must leave it in for one year to compost before you use it. Because we need the safety, we need the sanitation, we need to know these pathogens are being killed. And it, it, it's, a, it's a micro sidebar, but in, in order for it to really be clean and be truly beautiful, I mean, when it's done, it's beautiful. It's black, deep, humans, it's fantastic. You gotta give it a year. Give it a full year. And you can do that by staggering the, the compost piles themselves and date them and roll them and all that. Um, and that time is absolutely, and that's the time when you, the, the last bucket or the last load of what, whether it's a bucket system or commercial goes onto that pile, that's the date you check off to let it just sit there for a year. Now the neat thing with these piles out with this time, you don't, I'll, you don't have to turn them. You don't have to go out there and you know, if you've got the oxygen and, and everything's you know, it's open, wire basket, as long as they got access to air. And this is where and the outdoors is obviously, but especially, um, 
All the other factors that break down the pathogens come into play. The earthworms, there's fungi, there's bugs, there's, you know, there's a whole range of parts. It's not just the bacteria, although that's the most important part, that will get into this. And I mean, I, I throw it on there and not the I see earthworms coming out the side of it. They'll crawl right up there and the bugs fly. And, you know, and if you do it right, there's virtually no bugs and flies. I mean, you, you get a little bit, but, you know, no big deal at all on that. Uh, yeah, and a sidebar to that, which may shock a few, uh, especially the purest agriculturalists, if you're composting for a year and you're doing it right for human or composting, there's no reason that the meats and the fats and the cheeses and all this stuff, you can't compost, never use that in your compost pile. You hear this all the time, my ears flap when I hear people do it. What happens in the woods? You know, it, every, everything will compost, but it depends on the concentrations and the time available for it to happen. So if you got a year at it, you know, yeah, there might be a ham bone left over, a big chunk somewhere in there. The reason they say don't put in the meats and the cheeses and so on and the fats and, and all that is that it takes longer. And you want that compost to get down the, down the line as fast as possible for the garden. So don't put it in or else you've got to wait for it to be done. But there's no reason to say, well, which means if you have a human or a composting pile, the meats and the debris and the dead stuff and the offal and all that, throw it in, throw it in, add the carbon as you need it, and it'll, it'll break down very nicely. Um, and, and back to, now the year is really important because if you actually get thermophilic bacterial action, which you will get if you do even close to right, but we, we have to be sure with this. And... And I will, America said, we're Americans, and we're impatient as a whole. We don't like instructions. We don't want to be told what to do. Oh, we don't need to wait a year. I know a guy now, you know, and all this. Oh, please, give it a year. You're not in it for compost. You're in it for these other reasons. And if you do wait for the year, it is totally going to be good to go. There's no question about it. So it's really important to make sure that that time is given to it for that full time to break down. Yes, sir. So if you're looking at the year, and you said maybe six months, I imagine the six months would be like from spring to fall, not fall to spring. So if you give up the full year, you get all four seasons, right? Yes. Yes. And uh, bingo. You're almost ready to teach the class because what's going to happen in most climates, for most people, where you know, there's a, you're going to have winter. It gets cold. Remember I mentioned the syrophilic yeah, yeah. the, the compost, overall, that temperature is going down. Now, a compost pile, as, as you know, will heat up even in the winter and you see the steam and all that. But as it gets colder, it's a lot harder to maintain that thermophilic. It goes to mesophilic and it slows down. And if you're in an area, there's some places that if it's rock frozen solid, you can't, you got to compost pile of solid, just throw it on. Add it in there. Once it warms up, bingo, it goes back to it with a vengeance and starts over again. So yeah, so the, so yeah, well, we'll give it six months. We started it in you know the end of October, October and it'll be ready in March. No, 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 no. It won't do it. It won't do it. So and, and the cold weather has no apparent uh, uh, negative impact on it other than slowing it down. So people say, oh, it's a, you know, what are we gonna, you know, how do we get it in winter? It's good. Don't worry about it. Just add it up. And because it, it, it's amazing. I've noticed that annual cycle myself uh, with the compost pile I had during the winter, you know, start building like, oh, that four by four, it's almost full, almost full. And then by July, <laughs> it just goes down. So, so, you, so you can see this parallel with the regular agricultural composting. So what you know about that. Is, is right. There's nothing right. You're adding time to it. And uh, we're, there was the discussion about the standing rock and some of these other things. Um, a little bit of a diversion, but well, maybe not. It, 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 all of this still applies to this, and it's very manageable on a large scale. In f about, gosh, 15 or 20 years ago, I met this guy with FEMA. And, it, and we just started talking, and, and he said, well, we have this real problem with after, you know, uh, uh, disasters and so forth, and sanitation, and all, you know, what you see, we see it in the Easter, all this stuff, floods. And he's going, well, you just bring a couple of tractor trailer loads of straw out there and a couple of squatters, cases of TP, and just put it in a pile. 
You know, you can let it compost right there. You can come back with bulldozer. You know, there's a whole range. Whoa, did it really work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it works. You don't have to use it anymore because the problem is you didn't have the water. Right. You know, I so, said, well, how are we going to build the sewer system and put it in the water and tank it? You don't need it. You just need to take a dump and a pee and you keep it in one place. And you go, oh, wow, yeah, what do you know? And so some conversations have gone on since then and I've finally seen them talk about it. But for things like it, Standing Rock is the example, I mean, right now we're aware of. I don't know what they're, a friend of mine just left the day before yesterday to go out there. And I asked him specifically, so who's in charge of the shit out there? You know, what are they doing? I mean, I, for all the pictures, I haven't seen any Porta Johns out there. I don't know what they're doing. I mean, they may just be doing pit latrines, you know, which again, it, it's a concentration. If you've got... You got 15 people camping in the woods and nobody around for 100 miles and you're digging a few trenches, you get away with it, it's, it's going to go away. You know, but not when you have 3,000 now, 4,000? 5, yeah, the, I do know that Dave Hollister with uh, Sundance Power Systems mm -hmm. and some of his associates and friends, uh, I guess they left on the uh, what, October 27th, I guess now, I think there was a date just for this. Uh, to head out, and they brought, they've got a solar system, uh, I think it was a 1KW, I'm not sure, uh, and a small wind turbine as well to set up for power and some batteries and so forth all on a trailer. Uh, so that, um, and, and addressing that issue of where's, you know, where's the power coming from? Well, even if you're just talking cell phones and charging and lights and the very basics, you know, they're putting it together. Uh, I, I was gifted a uh, 2KW wind turbine last Friday. The guy said, hey, I got a turbine, you want it? Yeah, cool. So we're, I'm going to take it to ASU Boone next week, uh, then bench tested and checked out and so on. So that's where I'm hoping to go out there. But it, it, it's not about me. But when I go out there, that's one of the, it's a dual reason that I'm really interested in trying to find out what's going out there is, here's a wind turbine, where are you taking a dump? How you dealing with this? Because it really is a legitimate problem. Sure. You, you, if you get a tight encampment like that, and all of a sudden you get all these people coming in, it's not really, but it's like a hospital. You get all these different organisms, all these different people, all these different problems, and all it takes is one carrier. And all of a sudden, everybody's playing around in the crap, and the next thing you know. Um, which reminds me, in terms of the health thing, uh, that... Uh, it's really, really hard to get a disease from human or if you don't have it in the first place, right? Disease, there are some exceptions, I know they're late, or latent, but essentially you're not going to get cholera from the feces if you don't have it in the first place. You're not going to have these other problems with it if nobody in the family has the disease. Right? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's E. coli that's not clean, but, you know, people go, oh, my God, we're going to get all these plants. No, it's, but it's a vector for transferring it. So it doesn't mean, and that's one of the reasons why homestead, you got a family, it's one or two people, no big deal, composting, it's kind of sort of golden, you don't have any problems. you got to wash your hands, and we'll talk about that later on, and it, be sanitation, but you get into things like hospitals, and these refugee camps and all these other things where there are all these different bacteria, that's when it's like, whoa, hazmat suits to deal with this if you're not doing it right, because it really is a problem then. So, it, it, again, nothing's perfect on either way, but if it's you and your family and you got a couple of guests, everyone, unless the guest shows up and they're sweating, oh, 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 use the flush toilet. Get out of here. Uh, a couple of tips on this when you do it, come back to it. Uh, Emergency use, when the power goes out, the storms and all that kind of thing. It's in the back of the trailer. I invested in one uh, a week ago to go camping, and thank you. I didn't have to use it in the tent. Uh, a lovable loo, and I, I'm not pushing the brand whatsoever, but it's a five-gallon. You have to get your own bucket, but it's a little lid that snaps on a five-gallon bucket. I highly recommend especially if you're on the grid, and especially if you have utility power, and especially if your power tends to go out for these times. Uh, you can also use it for camping and going, and, and, uh, going out and all that. Uh, a couple of five-gallon buckets, I recommend a minimum of three, a 20-pound bag of pressed pine pellets, kitty litter, anything that can suck up cat smell is going to work really well. 
It does. <laughs> and it does. They're little pellets. And the, you can make boxes and all sorts of things, but the Lou cover thing that I found was uh, eleven ninety eight. Just snapped on, and it's a seal and a cover. So what you've got, and you know, three buckets is important because when you start, if you're out of power, you you just finished a big meal and you open the lid, yeah. it won't fit. You need to have the second bucket or third ready to go, and having those three items in place gives you something that it, you can deal with when all the power is out. It varies on what size, how much pellets, how the carbon and all that, but you can easily get a week out of a five gallon bucket per person, all right? And again, it depends how much you're putting in carbon and how much you're eating and pee and all that, but, um, but it's definitely from dumps and, and the carbon in there just to cover it for odors at the time, you can get out. And you've got, so there's 12 for the cover, uh, even if you go to the hardware store, Lowe's, it's like six bucks, I think, for those for the decent buckets. Get good ones, good handles. You don't want them to break. Uh, and then uh, the the seven ninety eight, I think it was for the twenty pound bag of the pellets. And you can get that bag of pellets to fit into a five gallon bucket. So it all stacked together in one little. Bit. Push it in the corner, and all of a sudden, power goes. Up. You open it up, take the empty one. Pour some in just enough to get a layer going on the bottom. Do your business. You got plenty. By the time you get to the third one, it, it seems like it's about a third of the 20 pound bag per mix. And, you know, that part I didn't measure exactly. But it really works well. It's really quick and easy. You can use this for camping. You go out and play, you know, some people have, understandably, I do too, you know, are serious aversion to uh, porta potties. <laughs> you know, so you look down at and those are really nasty just from an environmental standpoint as well. Like the chemicals and all that stuff ends up going in the landfill and, it, oh, and it's like, oh God, I'm there. Who just walked out of that? I'm not going in there. Not me. Uh, so guys have a minor advantage in some cases, but some of those are pretty darn nasty. So, uh, And that, that to me is the simplest, best, fastest, easiest way to have something totally ready for human or company. Now, that's obviously the bucket system. So the question becomes, what do you do with it when they're filled? So if you're doing it on a regular basis, yes, you're looking at um, just throw it on the compost pile and go from there. Uh, you do not want to put it down the toilet, especially on a septic system, because all those solids are going into your tank. If you take a minute or two in gray water later. Uh, it, so it, if, you're not, if you're only compost when the power goes, well, you're not composting. If you're only collecting it, then it's a little more problematic. But it's, it's better than holding it or not having anywhere to go. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, clarification. What kind oh. of um, absorbent is it? It's not the standard uh, cat, litter, cat litter, or is it? Uh, no, no, thank you. Um, it, it, I, have, I have all these things rolling in my mind mm -hmm. when I say it. And I, I get, okay, let's put it. It's the pressed pine. The cheap, it's, I pound for pound, it's the cheapest stuff out there. It, you do not want the stuff with bentonite clay. You don't want the chemical stuff. It will say right on the label, pine, pressed pine. Feline pine. Feline? Feline pine. Uh, and, and look, you look on the label, because, I, because when it, compost, for the very reason of human or composting, I went to the cat, oh, I, there was one of the most, oh man, cats stink. If I use this stuff, it won't smell. It was part of it. And I started going through the light. Well, clay, that doesn't break down. All these fragrances and chemicals and all this. I go, I'm not putting that in my compost pile. And I turned it over and it said, pine. And there are little tiny extruded pellets of it that are hard and really easy to work with. You can scoop them up with a little cup or a little, they're really nice. So you don't have the dust factor. And it's almost like magic. When you put it on the compost pile, get it, one, boom, it turns into sawdust. Just falls apart, absorbs the moisture really, really well to hold it together. And it, by the time you, because mine is a kind of a combination indoor and uh, uh, bucket system, it's kind of a hybrid. Uh, by the time you scoop it and move it, whatever out, it, it just looks like nasty sawdust. You know, it does a great job of it. And it's very compact. It fluffs up when it gets, draws the moisture, but uh, thank you, that's a good point. None of the bentonite or any of that other stuff in there. So, practical question, <clears throat> you probably have a, a compost pile for yep. your yard waste and gardens and that type of stuff. Yep. So where do you put the pile for this stuff? Uh, well, um, 
it, the, gosh, there were, there were actually some distance guidelines, but not next to the garden pile is my wise guy answer. Right. Uh, but I would say at least mm -hmm. 10 to 20 feet away from it. You know, you don't have to go too far, but just give yourself some room between it. Uh, and because so, you don't want to cross, you know, it, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and that's a margin. I mean, if, the, if you, I'm looking at building some uh, <coughs> cement block with air age, it's a more, more than just cement, but compost row for my place. And the two of them would be human or, and then two to four would be regular, larger composting, but that would have an impermeable barrier between them and it would be a timing thing there. So just not next to it. And then when you're done, it, it, again, you give it that time, let it go through its whole process, and I'll, I'll emphasize it again, I know it's redundant, you, you don't want to use it on food crops. You don't use, please don't use it directly. Now trees, ornamentals, shrubbery, you know, there's a range of things, but absolutely not food and, and root crops because you just don't get that much of it. It's just, it's just not there. Uh, and why take the risk? And if you if you're growing the you know the tomatoes and rutabagas and everything else out there, regular compost just that knock it through fast. You're going to be really good at it <laughs> once you get these things down. You you'll have plenty for that. It just and I and I think Joe Jenkins in the Human or Handbook. It, it's the only thing that I disagree with him in the, his whole book about is yeah just go ahead and use it on whatever you want after a year. Mm. No, just in case you don't want to do that. It's the only thing that's good. But it is, I mean, if, theoretically, it's perfectly fine to use it after a year. But why bother? I mean, you just, you're not getting the volume out of it. And the sanitation is always number one to me to get across is why risk it and you're not, just not getting that much of it. So, uh, and which, uh, we divert a little bit here. I've mentioned a few times the urine in the compost. Uh, is uh, uh, rich in nitrogen, and it's a definitely a benefit to a good outdoor composting pile and so on and all that, but too much in the bucket, too much in the system, it goes anaerobic, and so the urine issue, uh, as I understand what the project here is, we, I mean, I know we are, we're diverting the urine from the compost, and I mean, somebody's going to take a little leak while they're taking a dump, and you know, is that never, but trying to get most of it into these other buckets, uh, don't, you, don't, don't pee on your crops. I've had too many organic where you go, oh, I just go out there and pee in the fields. And I'm like, oh, no, please no, don't say that. And people, because there's a huge misconception, myth, whatever it is, that urine is sterile. It's nowhere near as nasty as feces. I'll be clear about that. But it is not sterile. It is absolutely not. That's a complete fabrication of, you know. It's, so you, you don't pee on the plants that, are gonna, you know, that you're eating. Uh, now, breaking down the urine into a, a stable, non-pathogenic liquid fertilizer is... If, am I close enough? That's Pat, one of Patrick yeah. Patrick Battle's points for us doing this project here. I want to check with people, you know, people work here. You know, is that how do we deal with that urine to make sure it's safe so we can put it out in the field, so we can put it out in agriculture, because it's nowhere near as pathogenic and dangerous as the feces itself, and that's true. But you think about it, it it's, it's not sterile, it's not clean. And you say, well, it's just gray water, don't worry about it. Well, Almost everybody knows what UTI stands for. That's not sterile. And there's all sorts of different things that run through our body that will come out with the urine, which are not sterile. So, uh, and you know, there's, they call it the health department black water. That's the sewage and that's the, the dumps and the craps and all that. And then the urine that comes out. And then there's the gray water which is generally considered off the sink in the showers and so on. And a lot of things, oh, urine's just gray water. Don't worry about it. No, it's not. Now, people be in the shower. If you say you never did, you're lying. We all do. You know, but stuff goes down the drain and so on. And it's a, it's gray water is less of a hassle than black water and composting, but it is still something you don't want to directly put on. And there's different ways of handling that. Uh, 
And I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Richard in a moment, too. But I do want to throw in here, that, uh, which a number of you brought up, I think, in this beginning. You know, we want to go off-grid. We're building a house. We want to put in the composting toilet. And what about uh, the regulations and, and so on? And, and, and if you have a flush toilet already, you can, you can get in a commercial system, or if you want to really be inspected, you can build your own or wait till they go away. I never said that. And do it again. Uh, but there is a, what do you do with the gray water for a living in a home? Let's say you are full composting, all right? You've got a composting toilet, you're diverting it. Where do you put the gray water from cooking, from washing and laundry and all that? Where does that go, okay? You, you run into problems just dumping it in the yard. I mean, it's, if you're the only one in the hollow and nobody around for 50 miles, well, let it run down to the creek, okay? But it doesn't work that way. So there is a very good reason to put in a septic system with a leach field, even if you're not going to use it, because that is where the gray water goes. And blanket statement again, but a, a, a septic system, or at least a leach field in a small tank going in there, if you're not crapping into it, it never fills up. You don't have to maintain it. Decades. It's just liquid going through. The reason it fills up and the reason they have all this maintenance and all that is all the solids going into it. You throw the TP into it, and your dumps, and the, the, the solid con constituent of your feces and so forth builds up, slimes up. If you're just putting in, so you then now have some place that's legitimate to put the gray water from the house, home, whatever you're building. Um, you have the backup for a flush toilet, even if you're not going to use it, which is fine, and you can still compost. So you've got to deal with it. Oh, the gray water treatment is a whole other workshop we could probably do for another day, but you still have to deal with it. So just to say, I refuse to have a flush toilet, I'm only going to have a composting in there. Sit there and think about it for a minute. What are you going to do with the gray water? And in terms of dealing with the health department, the building codes, and everything else, Plus being practical, reselling the property, if that's ever an issue, you know, people invest in property and homes and so forth, even if you don't use it, it you know, keep a, what do they, keep a box over it so nobody can see no. it, see? so people come to visit, and they, they don't stay that long if you just have a composter I found, <laughs> and then they go, okay, there you go, and then you get somebody you want to stay, okay, under the box, there you go, if you, if you can't handle the composter, uh, but it makes sense to have that, um, Gray water system, septic tank, or hook up to the municipal unit if you're not using it. So, um, I think we're, well, Richard, you ready to take a moment here? Yeah. Uh, trade it out. Uh, there's, there's loads more. We're gonna, we got lots more to go here. <coughs> That's my best of a wrap up for the moment and save our questions.